on this beautiful Sabbath day. So, what is it that so worries you, or upsets you, or even discourages you? Is it our leaders and politics? Is it the economy? <laughs> is it all of the unrest, wars and rumors of wars brewing all around us? Or is it the state of the church body? All throughout, the people that claim the Bible as their source of truth, tens of thousands of denominations, belief systems, and yes, more than one true, more than one uh, truly known, knows heresies upon heresies out there. Uh, in the church, there are setbacks, splits, division, people just leaving the faith entirely, and small numbers. I can definitely understand if any of those are where your hope is in the in that you are having and that you are having a bad day that just won't quit and seems to go from bad to worse. Out in the world, you've got politicians that just seem to be doing all they can to both make your make you dependent on them, but also your money ain't worth near what it was worth even five years ago. And yes, I said ain't. I know, believe me, I just bought a car. So what a difference this is from six years ago, roughly when I bought my last one. In our churches, synagogues, or temples, you put five people in a room together, you get at least six different opinions on a, on a certain on a certain matter, and if your beliefs on every single point of doctrine don't agree with mine, well, we split again and again. Frankly, it's truly miraculous to think that any groups <coughs> that any groups still meet together. Really, nobody seems to want to just look at the Bible. See what it says. Instead, most seem to want to go to commentaries, whether Jew or Christian. Some others like to go by their feelings or what makes sense to them, usually colored by their parents and their parents' parents did and said. But personally, I like the, he's right, I'm wrong, I'll get over it method. And... By the way, no, that line isn't mine. It's Pastor Bill Schultz's, and, well, I agree with it. Because definitely if I was going by what I wanted to do, I'd be wrong. <laughs> well, it is often not the easiest thing in the moment to do, but in the long term, it's always the best. You know, you just have to figure out one thing. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been, have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything, he, in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And I'm also going to go over to Romans chapter 7 real quick. One verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual. But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. 
How many people out there try to head, try to head, try to tell you that the law is done away, but when it's the most spiritual thing you'll ever do? What about all of the horrible things going on in in our country and the rest of the world that that are and will affect us? Well, go to Matthew twenty four. For some reason I found 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 I hung out in Matthew a lot in this sermon. Twenty four, four through eight. And Jesus answered them, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of birth pains. Now here's been, he's been, been asked to tell, tell us when his coming again will happen. On the end of the age. So if you're seeing, seeing these things going on, we're getting close. When things really get rough, though, do you cut and run, or do you press in and draw nearer to Jesus? Do you run from the flack, or do you charge in toward the goal? Matthew 19. Twenty-eight through thirty. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Just back a few pages to chapter 16, 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. It's a far, <laughs> far cry from the typical Oh, everybody gets it. Gets the same thing you find in most Christian churches. It's your works. He also said a lot of the same same thing in all of his his uh, speaking to the churches in Revelation. Told many of them, "I know your works or your deeds," depending on your translation. But again, back a few. To chapter 10, 21 through 25. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is only for students to be like their teachers and servants 
like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? And back for me, it's not even not even on a different page. Matthew nine, thirty-seven and thirty-eight. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore send out workers into his harvest field. And isn't it a shame there are so few workers? How about financially? Is that what disturbs you? Prices on everything have gone nuts. Cars have gone up by at least, yeah, by half at least. Home prices have skyrocketed, and food even has increased substantially. Does it even make you think about not tithing? Are you tempted? Or do you measure out God's portion and your feast tithe faithfully every time? back a few more pages Matthew 6 like I said I hung out in Matthew a lot in this message Matthew 6 25 through 34 therefore I tell you do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or, or, or about your body what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes Look at the birds of the air. Do they not sow or reap or store, store away in barns? And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not, so do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Oh. And out of Matthew for a moment. Gonna go gonna go visit Isaiah, chapter one. Sixteen through nineteen. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. You know, he says that he says that a lot. Gives you he gives you uh, if then statements. If you'll obey me, you'll get all these blessings. And as we know, Isaiah also said that the word of the Lord does not fail in its purpose, or I think King James says does not return vain. Go to Isaiah 55. I think the whole chapter. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, that you, you, 
Yeah. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the upright and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let, let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain... As the rain and the snow come down from the heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. <laughs> so when he's blessing you, he's making, making his renown great because he said he would. If, if you will do it, obey him. And one more encouraging passage. I think we could all use it. Malachi 3, verse 6 through 12. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. That ought to make just about anybody happy. <laughs> Says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. He almost never says that. In fact, on most things, to test him is a sin. But test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there is will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Now, while you're, tur while you're turning back to him, eh, you may have a time, a time as Job did. I mean, heck, he was, he, he, he was found blameless by the Lord, but was still tested. Or 
you may have to dig out of the hole that you found yourself found yourself in when uh, you were brought uh, brought out. Sin tends toward debt, and debt can be uh, well. Was it say kind of kind of like fire, useful servant, but a uh, I don't remember what what it was, but a horrible master. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Too far. Too far. Goodness, I ended up, ended up over in Exodus. Just verses 1 and 2. If you fully, fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Now, come on you and accompany you is actually kind of a weak translation. It's... H5952, and it's Nazog, or Nazog, I think, uh, to overtake, catch up, attain, to reach, to be able to afford. In other words, if you will do these things, then, well, you know how in America it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Well, God a.k.a. Jesus, is telling you happiness is going to pursue you. Just uh, don't be like some and be blessing proof. You got you to actually put, put, put out some jars. Uh, if you need more detail on that, check out a message I gave nearly two, two years ago called Count Your Blessings. As far as our leaders, you know, our elected officials, did you ever try praying for them? There's precedent in both, both Old and New, Te New Testaments for praying for our leaders. We'll go to the New first, First Timothy. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Now, of course, in America, we don't we don't have kings, but you know some right right now seem to think they are. But you no, know, well, that's that's kind of another story. Going over to Proverbs twenty two. One through three. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going. And pay the penalty. Eh, well, I must have really written down, gotten something wrong in here because that really won't preach. Oh, well, Jeremiah 29. <laughs> I'll have to look, look that one up later and see what, I, see what I wrote down wrong. Twenty-nine. 
4 through 7. Yeah. This is what the, what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. So that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So, and if you want to tie these two things together with your leaders and money, well, what do you get? Taxes. Bill's going to love this one. Matthew 22, 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil and evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him the denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. <laughs> you know, there's certain things you kind of wish he'd, 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 he'd left out. No, no, he, he's going to cover it. So, what has you so worked up? Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. He told them and us these, these things so that we wouldn't worry about these things. So we could focus on his work, kingdom work, though we are supposed to watch and be prepared for when it happens, that we could see it, acknowledge it, and execute program for what needs to happen in our lives or even in the church. To Galatians. Galatians. Uh, went by it. Galatians six, nine through ten. Let us, <coughs> let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And, of course, there's the church issues. I really think these are the ones, ones that the Lord best prepared us for, but it's also the ones that seem to hurt us the worst. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> see. Matthew 13, 24 through 30.
parable of the weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. (coughs) There will always be those in the church that are sowed, unfortunately, not by Jesus. And they don't always wait to be pulled up at the end. And when they are pulled up, or they pull themselves up, they often carry off some of the harvest with them. Matthew 16. Eighteen and nineteen. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Basically, just that even death and the grave would not overcome the church, a.k.a. AKA the body of Christ. (coughs) Think about how many times throughout history the governments of this world have tried to stamp out the church. We've been killed in droves, our bodies anyway, but someone always escapes or Jesus just raises up another group or two or 20 in their place, just to go, (laughs) you thought you could stop them. (laughs) Then, of course, there is the subject of divisions in the church, which are generally a bad thing, (laughs) as we are to be one as Jesus and the Father are one. You know, it's that math again. A A equals B, and B equals C, then A equals C. If Jesus is one with the Father, and we each are one with Jesus, then not only are we one with the Father, but also with each other. So, how, if that's the case, does it happen? Well, 1 Corinthians... Eleven eighteen and nineteen. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been <laughs> there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Also, a quick trip back over to Malachi. I keep overshooting it one way or the other. (laughs) Malachi 3, 1 through 4. I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come 
says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure to the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, and in days as in days gone by, as in former years. He said he was going to purify as a refiner of silver and gold. So, well, can the contents of his refining pot really complain when impurities are removed? Oh, and also, uh, by the way, made more valuable in the process to him. Let's go over to Romans 9. Nineteen through twenty one. One of you will say to me, Then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purpose? and some for common use. So if he has made you specifically and with so much care, will he not protect you as long as you are in his will? Psalms 91. Or Psalm. I always tend to put, put the extra S on there. shooting it. Ninety one one through sixteen. Eh, I guess that's the whole chapter. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. And don't be like, <laughs> like treading on the snake. <laughs> you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Which we could also be, be translated, and I will show him my Yeshua. And quick trip back to Deuteronomy 31.
be five, huh, five and six and eight. The Lord will deliver them to you, and you must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And of course, many of these promises were made were made to Israel, and many will say that we're the, we're, we're the church, not Israel. Well, let's go see what Brother Paul happens to say about that. Uh, Ephesians 2. Eleven through twenty two. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at, the, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope. And without God in the world. But now in Christ, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier and the dividing wall of hostility. By the setting aside of his flesh, the law by the setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the, in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit and also Romans chapter 11 11 through 32 again I ask did they stumble so as so as to fall beyond recovery not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if the transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. 
You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, providing, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you, will, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut, off, cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. In this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I, when I take away their sins. <coughs> As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved one, loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God and have now, now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so too, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Kind of sounds like, sounds like if you're gra grafted in, you're Israel. Whether, whether it's physical Israel or whether you're Israel through his blood. You're just in. <laughs> so, both grafted into Israel as well as the household of God. That's a bit bigger. <laughs> Hebrews 2. and 11 in bringing many sons and daughters to glory it was fitting that God for, for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters And First John. Chapter three, one through ten. <clears throat> See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. 
No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous. Why is that one so difficult? The one, just as he is righteous, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them and cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who are the children of God, who the children of God are, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. So, we are children of God. And if you really think logically about that simple statement, if you are children of God, then what are you? In the flesh, you are children of your parents, and your parents are human. So what are you? You're human. You are children of God. Let that one sink in for a moment. Just as if you're children of your parents, you're, they're human, so you're human. If you're children of God... You're of his family. Most Christians today would call that blasphemous. But the Bible says it plainly. And as we read John says it, then doubles and triples down on it. Also including, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Go over to Second Corinthians. Chapter 3. 7 through 18. <clears throat> now if the ministry that brought death, which is engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to, the, to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate, or that could be also be translated as reflect, the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now this is what those familiar, familiar with the worldwide Church of God and its splits, offshoots, etc., called the truth that you were created in the image of God Genesis 2 27 you were told of, told of and in the case of Israel given the commandments 
so that you could have a close personal relationship with God. But Chris, no one knew anything about the law until Sinai. I'd say study the law, then read your Bible again. Abraham, in Genesis 26, 5, in fact, let's go there. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, my instructions, and my instructions. Sounds an awful lot like he knew. <laughs> Noah knew which animals were clean and which were unclean. Not to mention the popular idea that it was only two of each animal in there. No. There were two pairs of each unclean animal and seven pairs of each clean. As well as all the birds. Some right off there, for some odd reason, it was seven pairs. Eh, pairs of every bird. Clean or unclean. And of course, Job says that he was found blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. These were just to, just to name a few. And that your receiving of the Holy Spirit. That you, that you are the new, the new creation, a child of God. Now, next time the enemy, a.k.a. the deceiver, the accuser, tries to get you upset, worried, or discouraged about what's going on, what's going on in the world or around you in the church, just remind him of your future. And if you really want to get their goat, remind them, right? eh, remind them of theirs.